Sanity and Semantic and the Semantic Environment Symposium, part two, part two, because it's a continuation of the symposium that was held live in person following last year's Alfred Korzybski Memorial Lecture. Uh, the lecture was on October 1st, the symposium on the 2nd and 3rd, and we promise to continue and have a symposium online this year, uh, which is what we're doing right now. And we will be holding our next Korzybski lecture on October 7th. Again, that's live in person in New York City uh, at the historic Players Club in Manhattan. And you're all invited to join us and uh, that also includes a dinner. And then there will be an in-person symposium that uh, weekend as well. Uh, it is one of the great membership benefits, uh, one of the great benefits of being a member of the Institute of General Semantics uh, to have admission to this event, to be able to participate in the symposium, to be able to partake of the dinner, which uh, everyone was really, uh, uh, really loved last, uh, last year. Um, and we also offer, for those of you who can't make the trip, uh, the exclusive ability to live stream uh, the, the events uh, as they occur. Uh, along with that, membership benefits uh, in the IGS include subscription to et cetera, uh, a review of general semantics, our quarterly journal um, that's edited by Tom Jen Corelli. Uh, if you're not a member at this point, you can join now because uh, this year we'll uh, be publishing two double issues and they have yet to come out. So you'll be able to get the, uh, the issues as they come out if you join now. Uh, and uh, we'll also be, we also offer discounts on book purchases. We publish books and uh, other materials and uh, we'll be offering courses. Some of them will also have a discount uh, as well for members. So all in all, it's a tremendous bargain uh, at $50 for a regular membership. Of course, we welcome you to contribute even more to the Institute, uh, only $25 for student members so uh, should encourage students and friends and um, everyone you know to, to join because this is uh, really a wonderful kind of experience that we have to offer to everyone uh, involved. So we're really glad that you could make, us, make it here uh, and join us for this event. Uh, we'll be starting now and uh, for our first session, I'm going to introduce the chair of that session, uh, Ava Berger, who is a professor of communication at the College of Management and Academic Studies in Tel Aviv. Uh, Ava, uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Lance. Uh, it's great to see you all. Welcome to our first session. Uh, called Semantic Environments. Good morning to everybody in Brooklyn. Good afternoon to everybody in uh, Greece uh, and this area of the world. I'm in Tel Aviv. Uh, and good evening and good night to those of you in India and in Australia. Uh, each presenter gets 15 minutes maximum. Uh, let's try to keep it on time. Uh, then we'll have 10 minutes or so for Q&A. And uh, in our attempt to keep things on schedule, let's go right to our first speaker, Renee Peterson from Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Australia. And the title of her talk is, oh, the sharing of the screen erased my, Okay, here we go. And the title of her talk is How Are Celebrities Navigating Their Contemporary Media Environment? Renee, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Sorry for taking away your screen share. <laughs> that wasn't my intentions. 
I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which RMIT University stands and where I conduct my research. RMIT University respectfully recognises elders both past and present and to the traditional owners from where you are watching via online today here in Australia and worldwide. Hello everyone, I'm Renee Peterson and I'm honoured to be invited to speak about my research at the Science, Sanity and Semantic Environment 2 online symposium in New York City in the United States of America. Thank you so much for your time today. It's greatly appreciated. Um, my presentation today will be focusing on how celebrities are navigating their contemporary media environment. But before addressing this research question, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm a radio and television presenter, producer and writer. I've worked in the media industry for over two decades in Australia, Los Angeles, New York, love New York, um, and internationally, including London and Dubai and other countries. Um, I'm currently a PhD candidate from the School of Media and communications and my PhD research is called From Screen Celebrity to Social Media Influencer. My creative practice-based research project is a podcast series that's 10 episodes. Um, that will be the creative artifact for my research alongside a 50,000 word dissertation as the creative research output for my PhD project. Um, I would like to, I was going to play you a little bit of my show reel, but we're, we're a little bit stuck for time, but I would just like to put it on mute so you can actually see that what I just said I have done for the last two decades is actually true. Um, interviewing the world's biggest stars on the red carpet in the United States of America and London. So there's a quick sneak peek. Um, I would like to play you uh, the trailer to my podcast um, and that will give you an insight into my research before I address the research questions. So um, please enjoy. Here we go. From Screen Celebrity to Social Media Influencer is a series created, written, produced and researched by media professional, PhD candidate and future Doctor of Media, Renee Peterson. Ryan Seacrest. I'm Oprah Winfrey. My name is James Corbin. Hey guys, this is Tony's Night. Renee Peterson on the black carpet for the premiere of Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 2. My name is Neil Postman. My name is Lance Strait. Welcome to the series from screen celebrity to social media influencer. I'm Renee Peterson. I am an Australian commercial radio and television presenter, producer, writer, social media master, and an attributed celebrity. My passion for media has directed my career path to become a PhD candidate within the media and communication research field. My PhD is a creative practice-based project. The focus is how a celebrity engages within the contemporary media ecology, their media practice practices and their relationship with their social media producer that affords the celebrity to be influential on social media platforms as an influencer. The series features a plethora of worldwide well-known radio, television, film and music celebrities and social media producers employed in the contemporary media ecology who discuss their lived experiences as celebrities and social media influencers. Listen to the series from Screen Celebrity to Social Media Influencer, hosted by Renee Peterson at ReneePeterson.com. Spoken by the voiceover guy, authorised by Renee Peterson, future doctor of media. So as you can hear from that podcast, um, that trailer is playing a major role in recruiting celebrities and social media producers for my research. Um, as this audio translates to the world of academia, but also celebrities captivating their attention to my research and giving myself a clearer understanding of celebrities navigating the contemporary media environment, which leads me to my presentation today about how are celebrities navigating the contemporary media environment. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to the concept of celebrity, if you're not adverse with it. The concept of celebrity was first identified by Richard Dwyer in the book Stars in 1979. And before this concept in the 1900s, a celebrity was primitively known as a picture personality, either by their names or by the names the public had assigned to them. Throughout my research, I've discovered a plethora of scholars who have explored the concept of celebrity from Chris Rocheck to Graham Turner to P. David Marshall, Daniel Borstein, um, and Christopher Bell. However, it's the five types of celebrities um, as discussed by American scholar Christopher Bell in his book, American Idol Tree in 2010 that are the theoretical framework um, for understanding how celebrities are navigating the contemporary media environment. 
These celebrities are scribe celebrities, attributed celebrities, achieved celebrities, celetoid celebrities, and an accidental celebrity. So at this stage in my research with my data collection, my celebrity participants basically are explaining their understanding of what it means to be a celebrity, if they believe they're a celebrity, which celebrities they admire and why, and you know their current contemporary media environment and more. All the celebrity participants in my research, especially in my podcast series from screen celebrity to social media influencer, are selected based on their professional careers and my connections in the media industry of radio, television, film and music. So what is the current climate of the contemporary media environment for celebrities? Well, presently, celebrities are challenged in this contemporary media environment and having to adapt and navigate their celebrity status to become social media influencers. In particular, the attributed celebrity, which Bell, um, you know, decided that, you know, in 2010, this is a celebrity who is born from a highly concentrated focus of cultural engagement, such as like, radio and television, journalists, publicists, photographers, chat show hosts. An example that you may be familiar with is Ryan Seacrest, or who is the host of American Top 40, um, or On Air with Ryan Seacrest, um, which is global. Or if you are a fan of Carpool Karaoke, James Corden, um, or my radio career as a radio and television personality. My research is focusing on the daily media practices of these celebrities in their contemporary media environment, either by themselves, if they're actioning it daily, depending on what media platform they're using, or the media practices actioned by their social media producers or digital content directors. And I know in different countries around the world, they're described, those roles are described differently. Um, basically, it's to ensure whether the celebrity or the social media producer um, ensures that the celebrity makes a professional transition and navigates the contemporary media environment to a social media influencer. And, you know, this is really imperative for the survival of their careers. Social media influencer in the academic world, what does it mean? Well, my own body of research understands that a social media influencer is an individual who has a public profile across social media platforms from Instagram to TikTok. And to be acknowledged as a social media influencer, an audience engages and connects with the content that is created and published on their profile. Influencers are the epitome of celebrities. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, I'll re rephrase that. Influencers are the epitome of internet celebrities, given that they're making a living from being celebrities native to or on the internet. Crystal Aberdeen is one of the academics who is focusing on influencers in that world. And basically in the contemporary media environment of a celebrity, having a presence on social media platforms, this occurs daily in media practices, um, as discussed before, whether it's by themselves or a social media producer that they engage with. Basically, my initial starting point for my research um, when it comes to social media influencer begins with Crystal Aberdeen on her work. Um, and in addition to this, I'm using that along with Christopher Bell's celebrity, an attributed celebrity and marrying the two together. Basically, during my data collection, it's imperative to have the social media producers um, to discuss where they're sitting, what they do for the celebrities, their importance of their role in creating the content across all the platforms, and how these celebrities are navigating the contemporary media environment to become social media influencers. So let's find out how the celebrities are navigating the contemporary media environment. I would like to introduce celebrity participant, Australian Toby Rand. He's an established rock star artist. He's based in Los Angeles. Uh, he starred in a plethora of bands from Duke Cartel, In Excess, uh, rock star supernova television show with Tommy Lee. He's an achieved celebrity because he's a rock star, pop star. Um, and he is an achieved celebrity because of his accomplishments. So basically during my interview with Toby, we discussed about the understanding of celebrity. We also um, talk about if he identifies with one. But the most important thing is obviously Toby has his own social media platforms that he runs and he has social media producers that run his band's platforms. Um, but the big question is, you know, how is Toby navigating the contemporary media environment? Let's take a listen. I think I look at it as a tool, really. I look at it as something that's a necessity. It's not something that I, I'm completely excited about always having to investigate. But one of the, the things that anyone that works with me in the bands that I'm in, they, they'll know that I'm constantly trying to get behind the scenes content so I can put it out. 
through whatever media outlet we have. I know that in the past, like going on a radio show like yours or in the past, I really enjoyed it. I knew that that was a great vessel for people to get to know an artist. And we used to do a lot of TV stuff and MTV stuff, which was always really beneficial. But these days, I think media is, it's, it seems to be at what at home media mm. you can do. It's what I can do. It's almost like you may as well create your own TV, your own platform and learn how to put it out like much like a TV station. We're trying to get an audience. That's what you're trying to do now because you have a whole gamut of different options to get your one brand to link back hopefully to the one vessel, which is people buying your record or wanting to watch your show or whatever you're into. So, or coming to your show. So media, I think is, is um, you can be your own media company potentially. Mm. That's, that's what it looks like to me. So yeah. yeah. And now it, it all it costs is $44 a month to keep your phone on and you can actually do whatever you want from here <laughs> like this right now. Which is an, an interesting point that Toby has identified that you can be your own media company and you can create your own media environment and climatize with what's happening out there in the world. So that was a really interesting point from Toby. Um, Please meet our next celebrity participant, Jeff Stinko. He is the guitarist from Simple Plan. He's an achieved celebrity as well due to his um, skills as a rock star. Um, Jeff, in the interviews that we've done, discusses in detail his understanding of celebrity, the biggest lesson he's learned in his career. Um, He obviously uh, has his own social media platforms, but also his band does. And the really interesting themes that are emerging from this research interview with Jeff is when Simple Plan had a TikTok account, but it wasn't really active with content. And then all of a sudden, some fan decided to create a content video using their song, I'm Just a Kid, which you might've seen in the US, and it's had something like 4 billion hits. Um, so obviously from that moment in their life, a Simple Plan, Um, Jeff talks about why it's so important for celebrities to have social media platforms in this contemporary media environment. Why do you think or do you think it's important that a celebrity has a social media platform? Oh, absolutely. You have to. There's really the thing is we are transitioning to a new era. Basically, what's happening is that what what used to be like the era of tastemakers, people that actually, you know, suggested what you listen to told you, you know, what to watch. That's changed now. You're you're your own curator now. You basically, you have to choose what movie to watch amongst thousands of options, which music to listen to. You browse, you go deeper, you listen to artists that resemble other artists. And, and, and you're basically doing the job that presenters were doing, journalists were doing, music, you know, uh, uh, journalists and critics were doing. Um, So now if you're on a celebrity side, the only way to address people is to make sure that you're visible. And the best way to be visible right now is to be on the platforms that every single human being on the planet is actually paying attention to. You know, it was Facebook at a time. It's not anymore. And uh, Facebook now, um, you know, people migrated to Facebook, to Twitter to Twitter, to Instagram, to TikTok, to Twitch, and, uh, and, and and it goes on, the list goes on and on. But now as a celebrity, you have to decide where am I gonna be present? Because at some point you're not gonna be able to service every single uh, outlet unless you do it in an non-organic way and you hire a team and, and you get it done you know, uh, outside. But I think that people are very allergic to being sold things now. Yeah. So unless you have a real honest presence online, I think people will react. And I think that's a really interesting point that Jeff talks about the contemporary media environment as an achieved celebrity and not about the algorithms of social media and the importance of where they need to have a presence in their contemporary media environment. And that is really well discussed um, with Jeff. I know that we yeah. I have a little bit more time left. I have... Another interview with Lola Berry, um, which I won't play, but I just, I wanted to let you know that she is an Australian that's based in Los Angeles and her contemporary media environment is extremely important. She's across a lot of social media platforms um, and working in Australia and moving to Los Angeles, she's navigating her contemporary media environment. Basically for celebrities, the contemporary media environment 
um, you know, from my research to date and what I've shared with you in such a short amount of time, you know, it is about the celebrity engaging with social media platforms, finding out where they want to have their presence, what is the most important platform for them to use and to constantly evolve with old media, which in the academic world is called radio, television, print and online, um, to the new media world, which is social media platforms and, and how they can have a presence in that environment. And I think that brings me to time. Thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> I hope you understood and I didn't speak too fast as an Australian. I know that Lance and I, you know, he said that, you know, Australians, we talk so fast. <laughs> no, you were perfectly understood. And I sent Renee a message um, three minutes before her time was up. And uh, it's been a long time since somebody actually you know, did something with this message. So thank you so much. And I hope we can keep this uh, on time. It was fascinating. I have a few questions, I'm sure uh, awesome. a lot of us do, and we'll get to the Q&A later. If you want to just unshare your screen yeah. for us. Awesome. Thank, thank you so you. much, Eva. That's radio yeah. and timing. That's Absolutely. why I'm on time. I, I can <laughs> That's tell, my yeah. background. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's move on to our Second presenter, um, Tanisha Gwynn from the Gandhi Institute of Technology and Management in India. And the subject of her talk is the subject of knowledge, reading manhood of humanity as an identity project. Tanisha. Thank you. Uh, good morning, evening here. And it's wonderful to be a part of this conversation. And Professor Strait and everyone at IGS, thank you so much for this opportunity. This paper started as a thinking project when we hosted a program at Balwan Parekh Center in Baroda, India, to celebrate 100 years of manhood of humanity. And we had to think about why is it that we still want people to read this book? Is it relevant? Is it redundant? Is it relevant in our own contexts? And I was not a scholar of general semantics when all this started. I'm still going through the core readings, but this is my way of trying to make sense of things. So bear with me. Now, you may have noticed this paper is titled The Subject of Knowledge. When I use the word subject, I use it here in two senses, both as the central focus or topic of a discussion and as the agent or chief actor in an event. It's important to note this at the very start because this paper argues that manhood of humanity, excuse me, <laughs> that's uh, the Vesper call from our house. Um, sorry. Uh, because it's important to note this at the very beginning, because this paper argues that manhood of humanity is an exercise in creating an identity project from scratch. The compelling ways in which Alfred Kozhevsky achieves this, the lucidity and ease with which he brings together fairly familiar, even commonsensical ideas together, and then reworks them in new configurations and thereby makes it impossible to unlearn them thereafter, is the focus of this paper. In doing so, it not only continues to be relevant, identifiable, but also its sense of urgency only amplifies in our lived realities. I am a student of identity studies. In my doctoral work, I primarily looked at the ways in which identities are imagined in terms of similarities and differences and how the lived reality of these identities and identifying practices can conform to or disrupt, subvert, run in excess of the imagined heuristic boundaries. I looked at bazaars, which are some of the most heterogeneous spaces, marketplaces in India. The word imagined here is not used in the sense of a lie as opposed to a truth, especially an objective or universal truth. It is used instead in the sense that identities are socially, discursively constructed. They are not given pre-existing realities that we are then talking about. 
Along the way, I have found great use of the concept of identity project. Though modern identities are often understood as fragmentary and fractured, they are imagined in terms of a coherent grand narrative with a distinct beginning, middle, and hope for future. This imagination is what is called an identity project. No matter how majoritarian or peripheral an identity is, across what intersections of sex, gender, sexuality, caste, class, race, location, or linguistic and other ethnographic details one is attributed, most members of an identifying community or social group hold within themselves the sense of a shared identity project. I like Benedict Anderson's imagined community, that, that word. It makes sense in this sense, in this context. These projects are constituted by the ability to sustain a cohesive narrative of the individual or collective self, which facilitates the creation of a biographical continuity. And of course, identities cannot be imagined in isolation. They are always in relation to someone selectively similar or dissimilar. This constitutes perhaps the primary difference in, me in the meanings between the word self and subject. The word self does not capture the sense of social and cultural entanglement that is implicit in the word subject. The way our immediate daily life is always already caught up in the complex political, social, and philosophical, that is shared concerns. Identities are imagined by subjects. The isolated interiority of the self does not lend itself easily to the shared play of similarities and differences in which we are discussing identities in this context. And when Korzybski refers to human beings in Manhood of Humanity, especially in his discussion of time binding, he definitely understands them in this sense of the word subject. He says, and I think I'm quoting from page nine here, past achievements, the fruit of bygone time, does live in the present, are augmented in the present and transmitted to the future. History is an expansion of memory. And like memory, it alone can explain the present. And in this lies its most unmistakable value. Further, subjectivity is an embodied experience. Current discussions of subjectivity, drawing from the works of scholars like Louis Althusser, Michel Foucault, Judith Butler, and others, resist the enlightenment understanding of human beings as minds trapped or contained in bodies. They refuse to discuss human subjectivity as a debacle between mind over body or body over mind in favor of entanglement of the somatic and the psychiatric. Korzybski's emphasis in the very introduction of manhood of humanity, that man is neither a falling angel nor a rising ape, essentially refutes this way of looking at human subjectivity in terms of purely the mind or solely the body, right? He says, Again, I think this is page 10, sorry, that was page 29, I think. He says, what is a human being? One of the answers is biological, man is an animal. The other answer is a mixture partly biological and partly mythological or partly biological and partly philosophical. Man is a combination or union of animal with something supernatural. An important part of my task will be to show that both of these answers are radically wrong and that beyond all things else, they are primarily responsible for what is dismal in life and history of humankind. So in other words, in Manhood of Humanity, Korzybski responds to the question, what does it mean to be human? By shifting the focus from what human beings are to what human beings do. His conceptualization of time binding is predicated upon the shift. So, I will not try to explain time binding. I'm sitting among people who are more conversant in it than I am. Simply put, it refers to the unique ability that humans have of passing on knowledge from one generation to the next with the use of symbols. For Korzybski, time binding is what sets human beings apart from plants, chemistry binders, or animals, space binders. In the understanding of human beings as time binders and human civilization, in a manner of speaking, as a process of perpetual time binding, one corollary becomes very crucial. 
Implicit in the notion of time binding is the entanglement of human beings and knowledge. Within the framework of time binding, one cannot think of humanity without taking into account the knowledge they produce, receive, transform, define themselves and their actions in terms of. Humanity takes on many names in daily usage, self, selfhood, personhood. Sometimes they're hyphenated like citizen subject. This paper has briefly discussed the relevance of the term subject when it comes to discussing Korzybski's understanding of humanity. Time binding makes it impossible to think of human subjectivity and knowledge except in terms of each other. This entanglement is very crucial because it implies that Korzybski's understanding of the grand narrative or identity project of humanity reflects this terms. For him, meanings of words like history or progress or wealth cannot be accessed except through this understanding of time binding. As I mentioned, any identity project generally involves a fixed beginning, middle, and hope for future. In the first few chapters of Manhood of Humanity, indeed in the title itself, this trajectory of Korzybski's thoughts or projected wishes about his identity project materialize. The implications of this definitional shift are profound. I am, for instance, talking to undergraduate students about childhood and how we learn to think of it, what kinds of knowledges we bring to the table, what are the ways in which things are remembered and forgotten, and are words like time binding or media ecology relevant in that? I am discussing loss about the death of a migrant laborer, a 12-year-old girl who collapsed and the ways in which Indian media reported her death. More directly, coming more closely to the book, in the chapter titled Wealth, he says that wealth is generated and accumulated by generational progress. Money may be codified time, but time isn't money. In capitalistic era, he critiques both the communist emphasis on state control and the capitalist laissez-faire economy because of both their reliance on a controlling and holding group. He acknowledges differences in the degree of time binding, even as he destabilizes hierarchies in favor of a collective ownership. General semantics lays great emphasis on being aware of the role language plays in shaping our perceptions of our world. If there is one thing that GS would like us to be aware of, it is that the question to what is going on is always contingent and provisional. Meanings mutate. They aren't rigid, inflexible, or watertight. All the tools that GS offers, terms like indexing, for instance, are there to help us be more responsive to this flexibility. What does this have to do with time binding? The knowledge produced on and by human subjectivity that is intrinsic to time binding is obviously one that conforms to this understanding of meaning making. That is how it is time binding. There is a sense of continuum and yet that continuum isn't a st stagnant one. It contains within itself the possibility of adaptation, transformation. In some ways, it resonates with the idea of the performative or the speech act an act in which you reiterate a normative action, where the very act of repetition contains the possibility of transformation, even subversion. If seen in this way, the identity project Korzybski proposes has the potential to match integrity with flexibility, constancy with change, to not only accommodate, but celebrate the disparate redefinitions of human agency we continue to encounter in our lived realities. One of the ways in which Korzybski's legacy aspires to reduce conflict is ingrained in this. This module of thinking of humanity in terms of a single collective identity project that negates the very idea that difference can be dangerous or is de facto dangerous. If difference is not dangerous, irrespective of how different an identity label is from that of the self, it doesn't call for violence rooted in discriminatory action. This credo of acceptance that Korzybski systematically lays out 
is at the heart of the reason why the urgency and relevance of his school of thought has, has only increased. In an increasingly neoliberal world, it's crucial to remember how, above all, Pozhupsky holds the dogma of survival of fittest, a false one, because um, to mention the lines he wrote in Manhood of Humanity, and I'll finish with this, the modern vast accumulation of wealth for private purposes justifies itself by using the argument of survival of the fittest. Very well. Where there is a survival, there must be victims. Where there are victims, there has been fighting. Is this what the users of this argument mean? Thank you. It's broadly what I have to say. Thank you so much, Tanisha. Uh, we'll definitely want to get to the question period. Uh, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we move on to our next presenter, Anomitra Biswas, also from the Gandhi Institute of Technology and Management in India. And the title of her talk is Dead Man's Labor, Reading Alfred Korzybski's Manhood of Humanity. Anomitra? Yeah. Um, hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I do like this full mix of time zones that we have going. While obviously it has nothing to do with Korzybski and manhood of humanity, it does make talking about time binding very interesting in this uh, wibbly wobbly timey winey stuff context that we've got going on. All right. Um, so it is splendid to be here listening to everyone. I'm very grateful for the chance to participate and I hope to be part of other such sessions in the future. It was wonderful to listen to Renee Peterson and also to Tanisha. And while obviously the program will stretch deep into the night for us, I look forward to as much of it as I can manage to. Attend. So uh, I wanted to speak very briefly about the book Manhood of Humanity, which I know is obviously very familiar to everyone else, but it was very new to me. Uh, when I joined the Balwan Parikh Center for General Semantics and Other Human Sciences in fall 2020. Uh, as a matter of fact, General Semantics itself was unmapped territory for me. I had studied semantics at university, but only in the linguistic sense. So please just bear with me as I fumble through this. Now, um, I was honestly intrigued from the dedication onwards. The dedication goes to the quick and the dead. I dedicate this work. Now, Korzybski, I don't really need to discuss, but obviously he had been through World War I, both as a frontline soldier and as somebody trying to gather manpower and advising on engineering. And in a very odd, I thought, social position as uh, an aristocrat in disgrace, as somebody, as a Polish person in the Russian Empire, as an aristocrat in disgrace with the Tsarist government, and later as a Polish or Russian citizen in the Americas. So I do wonder whether his own displacement from all of his national and cultural identities led him to look for universal human qualities. So that's obviously speculation. Now, obviously, Manhood of Humanity was the first of his books uh, published during his lifelong effort to formulate and promulgate the theory of general semantics. And I consider it a peculiar blessing to have read it in its centenary year and found it just as relevant now as it must have been groundbreaking then. So right at the start, Korzybski sets out the aim of his book as one of wayfinding for the science and art of human engineering, a phrase that formed the subtitle of Manhood of Humanity in its first edition. For Korzybski, this idea of human engineering signifies the process of directing human capacity for the good of humanity. For a phrase I 
think he was quite fond of given how many times it recurs in the book for the common view. Uh, and Korzybski obviously thought it necessary for such a project to be founded on the bedrock of a just conception of humanity. Not so much of its essence, which I mean, he was kind of skeptical of essential definitions from what I've seen, but of the position humanity occupies in the natural schema. And that more or less is the task of manhood of humanity. It, that of arriving at this definition and also of arriving at it in a persuasive manner. I didn't know till after I had read the book that this was his first work in English as well as his first book at all. And the clarity of thought in it was astonishing in retrospect. Anyway, uh, so Manhood of Humanity undertakes the task of arriving at and persuading readers of such a definition. None of the then prevalent conceptions of humanity satisfied Korzybski, who taught them, and I quote, primarily responsible for what is dismal in the life and history of humankind. However, Korzybski felt that a definition was necessary, since the correct definition would enable one to arrive at what he called the natural laws of humanity, much as a farmer might arrive as the natural laws of corn. Korshevsky frames his inquiry as a scientific task, essential to the betterment of regulated production, which is in turn essential to the survival of humanity. He undertakes this, I thought, in much the same vein as the time and motion studies carried out by the Gilbreths before and during World War I. I mean, the Gilbreths obviously precede Korshevsky to an extent, but something of the same motivation, I thought, lingers in. So in Manhood of Humanity, obviously, starting with chapter three, Korzybski formulates the idea of humanity as a time-binding class of life. I recognize that it is very silly to talk about time-binding in such company as this, but again, please bear with me. Uh, having dwelt on the importance of correct definitions and the pain and devastation caused by faulty conceptualization, analysis, and categorization, Korshevsky goes on to classify all living beings, plants, animals, and humans in accordance with what he perceives as their intrinsic function, which distinguishes them from other orders of beings and is universal within each of them. Thus, he classifies plants as chemical binders, animals as space binders, and human beings as time binders. In all cases, these are definitions not of essence, but of function. Not of what one is, but of what one does. So, therefore, for instance, Korshevsky calls plants chemistry binders or chemical binders for their ability to convert and store solar energy and functioning in effect as a battery, while animals are space binders because of their locomotory capacity. And humans are next in this progression. And while the things about plants and animals, of course, cohered very well with what I'd read in elementary school science. This was where it really diverged and honestly, where the book really got interesting. I was reading it essentially because uh, Professor Profula Kar, who was our boss at the BPC and is one of the leading uh, figures in general semantics in India, had insisted that I do so because obviously it would have been hard to work at a center for general semantics without knowing what it meant. <laughs> anyway, but so here is where it got interesting for me that Korshevsky completely diverged from then prevalent definitions of humanity, whether as entirely animal or a combination of animal and some undefined supernatural element. As Tonisha said, the place where the rising ape meets the fallen angel. Instead, of course, Korshevsky thinks of humanity as sui generis in a class of its own. Emerged from the animal, certainly, but as decidedly removed from the ape as the inverted bread from an oak. The difference lies, as always for Korshevsky, in the excess ability, in this case, that of time. -man. You will please allow me my notes 
going round and round the topic. But so time binding in very short is the capacity to summarize, digest, and appropriate the labors and experience of the past. While animals possess a great deal of collective memory, they cannot consciously transmit or make use of knowledge transmitted over generations. At least, I mean, if one sets aside to studies into corvid and I believe dolphin and octopus intelligence, as well as anecdotes about elephantine memory. So in effect for Korshevsky, time binding is what lies at the root of human progress, allowing every generation to begin its journey equipped with the tools and knowledge of the preceding generations. This accumulation allows and is responsible for progress in every discipline, albeit not at equal rates. And this progress, this accumulation of the living work of the dead distinguishes humanity from its animal predecessors. I do wonder how well this idea interacts with the uh, saying that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. A, a case of failed and flawed time, I think, perhaps not learning from the past. Interestingly, of course, uh, something that humanity as a whole is currently demonstrating its ability to do. Um, so I would like to elide Korshitsky's rather racist remarks about Aboriginal cultures. And instead, I'd like to note, well, I don't know whether to excuse it as a man of his time or a man of his culture, but Regardless, uh, what was more significant to me in this reading was his obvious horror of enslavement and oppression of any race or class of human beings by their fellows, whether or not in the apparent service of progress. So he completely militates right against both the notion and the implementation of instrumentum vocale, the human being as the vocal instrument, issuing as it necessarily does from a conception of some humans as closer to animal, instrumentum neuter, uh, than divine. This conception, I think, illustrates what Korzybski castigates as the great monstrosity of conceiving of man as part animal and part divine. For once having admitted to such an admixture, one becomes susceptible to a number of degradations and definitional perversities. It is also illustrative, I thought, of the pitfalls of time binding applied without a just conception of the time binding class of humans as only and equally human, regardless of the attributes so often used to divide and rule. Now, while obviously the Nazi classification of Jews as well was still in the future when Korshitsky wrote Manhood of Humanity, anti Semitic rhetoric of remarkably similar type had been in circulation for centuries, not to mention other racist rhetoric. And one may think of the pseudoscience of phrenology and the theory of polygenism, which prospered through the 17th and 18th centuries and persisted even into the 19th. And uh, what was, well, interesting but not surprising for me when I looked into it was that polygenism at least had had very prominent proponents whether Voltaire in the early 17th century or Charles Alfred Wallace in the late 19th. And in America, several polygenists came together to produce volumes um, called Types of Mankind, which was published in 1854, and Indigenous Races of the Earth in 1857. Uh, the latter included an illustration placing Africans in an intermediate stage between Greeks represented not by contemporary Greeks, but by the very famous Phidias statue of Apollo and, well, Manthropoid. Similar instruments were obviously used in most colonial anthropology as well, whether in Africa, in India, or I believe also in Southwest Asia, but I'm not entirely certain. I know, Mitra. I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. You still have about two and a half minutes left, but something happened to your microphone just about a minute ago. You see, sorry, you am I not audible? Am I audible now? Uh, you're audible, but with lots of background noise. I don't know what changed from the beginning. I 
don't really know how to manage that. You don't really have- That's okay to... now. That's it very, very seems better now. now. It seems oh. better now. So whatever you're doing now, keep, keep, keep up the- I okay. think it had just slipped out a little. Okay, oh. okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, sorry, yeah. So uh, the way obviously Koshitsuki develops the idea of the dead man's labor, essentially, this accumulation through the generations is, well, again, what I thought was very interesting that he begins chapter five well uh, by asking readers to offer him, and I quote, the cooperation of open-mindedness, candor, and critical attention, which I thought was very interesting because he had already been quite radical in his proposed reordering of human society in the preceding chapter. And then I read it and figured out why, because he spends the remainder of chapter five, as well as chapters six and seven, dissecting extant political economic conceptions of wealth, money, and capital, as well as the definitions of human nature upon which they rest. And so one may therefore understand his diffidence, both as a sincere plea, but perhaps even more as a dropped gauntlet of sorts. And this is where the idea of uh, time binding grows into that of, sorry, is conceived in terms of generational progress, the fruits of which he understands as constituting wealth. And uh, as Tonisha just mentioned, while disagreeing with the formulation time is money, Korshitsky does agree emphatically with the idea of the reverse. Insofar as he constructs money as the symbol of wealth accumulated through cumulative labor over time, and having established this to his own satisfaction, at least. Uh, Korshitsky, and overall throughout the book, while it is very persuasive, I did feel as though he was putting the words down in order to have them established in order to concretize his own very complex thoughts about the matter. Korshevsky shifts to querying the right of any individual or group to monopolize the wealth and knowledge that are the fruit of and transmitted by cumulative labor over time. This cumulative labor over time he calls living powers, which are the sum of the powers of the living, as well as the living fruits of the labor of the dead. Notably, Korshevsky questions the right of monopoly, regardless of whether it is used to hoard or distribute wealth, knowledge, and other resources. He also goes on to dispute the application of the Darwinian notion of survival of the fittest to human societies, and in particular offered as justification for capitalist accumulation and monopoly. I am aware that the idea of survival of the fittest may have been originally an economic notion that Darwin had adopted, but certainly by the time Korzybski was writing, as well as for us now, it is primarily a biological uh, biological and not an economic notion. So uh, I'll quote this paragraph from page 140 of my edition. Which is, the modern vast accumulation of wealth for private purposes justifies itself by using the argument of the survival of the fittest. Very well, where there is a survival, there must be victims. Where there are victims, there has been fighting. Is this what the users of this argument mean? Now, as Korzybski goes on to say, this method of doing things is in no way new. One need only think, well, for me, within my cultural context, what came immediately to mind was the ancient concept of machenya, a social situation wherein the big devour the little as fish eat fish. And second, I will drop. So uh, the earliest, I will tell you three of the earliest uh, references to the machenya. One is in the Arthashastra by Panini, sorry, by Tortilla where the specter of it is raised as the lawless alternative to royal dandami. Danda means star, so basically royal discipline. It similarly appears in the Shanti Parva of the Mahabharata as seen in the sloka Raja Chenna Bhavan Loki Prithviyam Danda Dharaka Shule Matsanyavi Kakshun Dullabatak Balavatvara. 
which is to say that when the staff-bearing ruler does not protect the earth, the powerful devour the weak as larger fish eat smaller fish. One may also find the general concept in chapter 11 of the Shatpat Brahman, they are referred to as the law of the waters. Now, the um, very, yeah, sorry, I'm, sorry. Am I I, I'm interrupting you again. I, I, I guess you're not seeing my messages. Take oh, two I'm more so minutes. Sorry, yeah, That's yeah, okay. I mean, Take two more minutes, okay? Yeah, I'm pretty much done. I'll just okay. Take, yeah, I'm done. So, writing in the aftermath of war and himself a previous, if decidedly privileged undertaker of anti establishmentarian acts, Korshevsky holds out hope for an ordered society arranged in light of his discovery of humanity's functional definition. Such a society, he believes, would render unnecessary all wars, insurrections, industrial disruptions. The back cover of my copy, which is the 2001 printing of the second edition, calls the book um, more important than ever in the 21st century and 20 years into the 22 years into the 21st century. This is a perspective with which it is difficult to disagree. Certainly, we have not, as a species, attained the maturity Korshevsky hoped to have witnessed in the red dawn of the interwar years a century ago. And in many ways, our situation now replicates his in 1920-21, very much including the pandemic, as well as the socio-economic and political facets of life. When I first read this book, I consoled myself by saying that, well, at least, you know, minorities and women and various religions have more rights and protections now than they did back then, but that does increasingly seem to be going as well. So I'm sorry if I've gone over time. Thank you. That's okay. That's okay. Bravo. Thank you very much. Uh, and we move on to our fourth and last in this panel, our fourth participant, Katarina or Cassia. Drogovska. She's yes, an independent. Yes. She's an independent scholar from Poland. And the title of her talk is Severance and Scary Numbers: Mapping the Territory of Contemporary Digital Labor on the Apple TV series. Kasia. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, try firstly if my sh uh, share screening works. Oh. That's perfect, almost perfect. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. Oh, that's great. Um, thank you very much for an opportunity to participate and I'm really honored and grateful. As this is my first time, then I feel totally like a beginner. So I'm really open for your feedback and questions both online and uh, offline. And I will support with my notes uh, because I really want to fit in the time in time. So uh, I, I hope that despite the, that fact, everything will go fluently. Um, maybe first a few words about myself, just a few. Uh, I'm from Poland. Uh, I'm independent scholar. I have PhD in social sciences, and I also professionally work in media business in string services for 15 years. Um, I think that what is really important that uh, my journey, uh, journey with general semantics uh, started with translating science and sanity into Polish. Uh, and right now I'm looking for publishers, so please keep fingers crossed. Um, because Korzybski is totally unknown in Poland and uh, also the same goes with uh, general semantics. So I think and I feel the mission to popularize general semantics in Poland. So um, I, I want just to share that uh, hope with you before I start. Um, and today I would like to discuss with you Severance, one of the most acclaimed uh, TV shows that was uh, premiered this year, and the show that is being compared with narratives of both Aldous Huxley and George Orwell. Uh, this is a story of macro data refinement uh, department, which uh, works for biotech uh, uh, company, and all of the employees are severed, which means that their memories have been surgically split between private and professional life. So when they are at the office, they have memories, they are inny, because this is how that part of their consciousness is being called. They are inny, knows only what is going on at the office. And when they are, they are outy, so they are outside the office in private, uh, they remember only what is going on there. Um, 
This surger surgically made split is irreversible and it's also necessary in order to be a refiner. Uh, and today I would like to focus on how, how the process of macrodata refinement uh, may be analyzed in terms of general semantics. Uh, and also what is really important, that process is a core of the serious, um, serious plot. So let's go to agenda first. Um, I would like to, uh, in the beginning, set the context for understand what scary numbers actually are and the refining process itself. Later, I will map the process in order to understand and to try to analyze it in terms of general semantics. Last but not least, uh, to sum up, we will discuss inhibition as a part of abstracting process. So. As I mentioned, um, severance process is necessary in order to be a refiner. And refiner is someone who makes something pure, more usable, and more accessible. Data refinement is based on uh, re removing all impurities from data uh, and reorganizing them in a way which is the most pure possible option. Uh, all refiners are being selected due to their emotional intelligence and intuition, which are core competences and all what they are doing is based on it. So as far as we know already, what is severance and what does it mean to be refiner? Let's go to the actual process of macro data refinement. So the process begins with opening the file that is being specifically chosen for refiner by his, his, his or her or they boss and refiner sees C of numbers on the screen. C that um, seems to be scratched endlessly in all directions. And over the time, refiner begins to feel something. And this feeling is caused by cluster of numbers that he sees on the screen, owing to magnify a glass that he or she uses. Based on that feeling, refiner defined a cluster, and after the cluster is being defined, the data are being highlighted and put into one of the five bins. And after they go into the bin, information about its contents uh, in terms of what kind of emotion, because there are basic four emotions that describe those numbers, and I will go to, to it uh, in a minute, that then what is being displayed is it is information. What kind of emotion consists right now um, uh, that, that being consists right now um, of? So it means that if we try to analyze that process in terms of structural differential on an unspeakable level, we have an event, an event is, which is opening the file, and an objective level, um, we have an action which is based on defining the cluster of objects. And what is really important is also the fact that objects are digital, so they are not in physical form. So a refiner human interacts with digital object and based on his, his or her or their intuition, emotions, he defines the cluster that causes this emotion, that causes this emotion and put it into one of the five bins. But labeling process, uh, this is a part of the process that is based on that is that is um, drive and defined by machine learning. So human human part of the process it is only on unspeakable level, and the whole definition of the process in terms of in, in, in verbal terms in terms of labeling is uh, is uh, a part of the process that, that is based on machine learning. And owing to the emotional part, machine learning can work uh, in uh, in practice. Um, what, what I would like to emphasize, emphasize that in, uh, in this series, we have four kinds of emotion, four basic kinds of numbers that are connected with emotions, the same way as Hippocrates um, defined emotions in, and all the medieval uh, medicine based on it. Uh, and they may be, of course, melancholy, they may be joy, they may be rage, or they may be fear causing. So the main uh, the main the main leader legendary leader of the biotech company uh, uses that paradigm in order to navigate the narrative about uh, his uh, corporation and the most important framing uh, for the process is the fact that the refiners don't know the ex exact meaning of what they are 
doing, what of, of what the of what number number means, which drives us to the conclusion that what they actually do is finding defining aesthetic pattern in terms of of in, in Batesonian terms. But they do not have any context. They don't have any context about why they are doing it and about consequences of their actions. And they also don't have any, um, any understanding of how time passes by because their INI doesn't uh, measure time in a way that it is used to be measured uh, if you are one integrated integrated cell because you are at the, at the office of all, all the time. And time-binding process is disrupted by the fact that their um, their consciousness is being uh, is being um, severed um, um, Jacques Ellul would say that because of the specialization they don't have any responsibility so what I would like to go uh, within few next slides is uh, his narrative and how we may use it uh, in order to understand that paradigm shown in the series uh, in the series better but also all of all of the workers of the employees of the department are sitting in the basement which if you are familiar with uh, Slavoj Žižek uh, pervert guide to history of cinema means that all everything is happening on uh, I, uh, on on the level of instinct in so they stay on I, the ID level all the time, never going up. Um, I would like also to emphasize that um, the, the whole history begins when one of the Innis starts to appear outside. So this is the trigger of the plot. But what is more, more important is that uh, this is the this uh, what causes real revolution is interaction with words, with labels, and with book, which uh, is written by by father-in-law of one of the um, one of, of my main character, uh, and this labeling this travel in order to find their identity when they uh, when they dis dispatched from uh, just uh, processes that are they are doing on a daily basis confront with that kind of narrative about self is a trigger of their um, starting to fight for um, having some context or if we may say that the context is the truth. This is how the, the, the common narr narrative calls it uh, there. And funny fact is that main character as Auti totally disregards the book, uh, but as Ini finds uh, his bank, find Dr. Ricken, his total idol. So this is also very interesting comparison, um, I, I, I think. And as pandemic boosted digitalization of label, today working with data in an unconscious and unconscious way is something which is totally common. Uh, this is most common paradigm of workload defining, I think. But human touch or human intuition is still irreplaceable by the machine. So human uh, is also a part of the process, a part of very important process because uh, he, uh, she or they is the, the, the aspect that, is, that can't be defined in terms of algor algorithms. So um, in that way, human becomes just a part of data input processing. Uh, and Elul would say that this is technology in the purest uh, purest way, because you, you can't be driven more by uh, your goal, your purpose and effectiveness. Um, as a reaction to that series, uh, Generation Z uh, calls recalls the metaphor of doing something dual, totally meaningless, ritual job. Uh, but I would like to focus on another aspect: uh, the split of consciousness. As series is defined as science fiction, I would like, um, uh, if we approach the subject uh, as per perhaps Jack, uh, Jacques Ellul would. Um, severance that modern society calls something which is future threat is actually going on for at least a century. Um, and this is something which we may call work-life uh, balance. <laughs> and in the opening scene of the series, uh, work-life balance is compared to CISO. And I think that what Jacques Lul would say uh, after seeing that whole process of watching the TV, of course, this is just my projection, would be that what is, not, what is really important is not to sit on that CISO and to be just one person on the CISO, but to try to not to swing and try to find unity, which will bring the recover and um, brings us clo closer to spiritual side of uh, part of our life. So that's all. 
from me. I hope. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes. You, you, you still had some time. Uh, very concise and very interesting. And actually, I want to watch that show. I really uh, recommend it so much. After your you presentation. Know, I've, I've watched it three times. And it was really uneasy for me to find something that would be, you know, some kind of synthesis for 15 minutes uh, story. Um, but I think that the, the, the amount of levels of patterns that is being shown there is amazing. And also even aesthetic pattern colors that are being used. And um, um, all of the references to uh, to uh, to, cult, to, um, to popular culture is really interesting. And also, I oh, I, I may I may give you one funny fact and also really interesting because um, very same very very similar paradigm, very similar pl plot of the story was written uh, by uh, Philip Dick uh, in sh uh, sh in short uh, short story Paycheck, uh, but. Philip Dick was deeply inspired by um, by the science fiction writer Vought, which, who, as I know, I, ho I hope that I spell it right because you know I'm not native uh, um, English speaker. So, but um, but I recall the name of that guy uh, Vought, and I know that he was fan of Kozybski. And to me, this is amazing how. Uh, general semantics concept and that kind of approach to reality circulates uh, in storytelling in most common media right now because that, that all stories surround us so much and my work professional war, uh, work is about you know sharing stories also because we deliver content and we define it so I feel how much it means and how carefully we should uh, approach each content that is being served to us so thank you so much for listening thank I hope you. I encouraged you to watch the series thanks you did more than that it was very interesting thank you so much Okay, we're we're pretty much uh, on time, which means we have about 10 minutes for questions. If you have any, if you want to just call out or, or raise your digital hand, your Tonisha, why don't we start with you? I saw you, Diane, you go next. You're muted, Tonisha. I'm, I just figured out how to applaud on Zoom. <laughs> so, that was very interesting. And I have a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, but uh, Rene, thank you so much for that presentation. In that, I have a question from a slightly different context. You know, when we are talking in the global south, and we talk about, Onamitra and I recently published a paper that looks at social media, what you very identified as contemporary media environment and the places, the liminal spaces within it. So um, as you know, India is famously homophobic and while sex education is officially mandated, it is not practiced, there are government rules about it, we are in a mess. And we have YouTube channels and Instagram handles which try to create this alternative spaces that are not just talking about sex in terms of violence or sex only in terms of abstinence, but are trying to open up an, a conversation of sorts. And YouTube celebrities or more and more OTT platform celebrities have a very clear overlap with these platforms often. And they are very liminally breaching scandalous and acceptable or mainstream and whatever other alternatives to mainstream are. Is there anything that I'm saying that you can relate with? Do you, in your work, is there anything that you can connect to with this? Would you like to comment on it perhaps? Um, thank you so much. Um, it's so lovely to meet you. Um, and look, it's a really interesting um, world the world of social media um coming from industry working in radio and television for almost 20 years um i remember being in los angeles working in 2011 and the evolution of social media platforms really came into fruition um and i remember i was working uh radio and television for australia as the entertainment reporter i was on all the red carpets creating content and sending that back for radio and television in australia in alignment with social media platforms when it comes to working for a media company 
company that is, um, you know, a public media company and there's investors and there's rules and, you know, you fall under the Australian Commercial broadcasting rules and regulations, you are very bound to the content that you produce. So something uh, like what you were talking about, and hopefully I'm answering your question here, um, would have to be very well orchestrated and monitored and broadcast through commercial radio and television platforms and across their social media platforms. The great thing about social media um, in its in its present tense is that you can be a celebrity and any type of celebrity, especially in my research field, um, the five types of celebrities, and you you can professionally transition into social media platforms and cr- control the content you're creating. Like Jeff from Simple Plan explained about where um, you know they want to be present and the content they control, but they're also bound by their record label and sponsor and everybody else. So what I'm looking at in the field of celebrity especially is it's about celebrities who are professional in their industry. It's not a social media influencer who has become famous overnight due to a content video that's kicked off and got a million views on TikTok, Um, whether it is, you know, touching on those controversial topics that you're talking about in India um, or whether it's it's controlled by a commercial radio or television industry. So, you know, I know there's very, there's, you know, some in Australia, social media influencer is a dirty word, so to speak. People don't want to be acknowledged as social media influencer. They want to be an ambassador or, um, you know, uh, alignment with, you know, um, a company or whatever. Whereas, you know, in, in the academic world and the literature that's been published on social media, there's so many layers to it. So does that answer your question? Oh, yes. I hope so, because I, I wasn't quite sure on, I I'm not, wasn't quite sure on the exact question you were asking, but that's like an overview of. I know. Uh, the definition of celebrity and what does it mean across these contexts will take a much longer time. And I don't think you have that kind of time, but. Yes, it would you be can lovely. listen. To, <laughs> you can listen to my podcast, but my focus definitely is professional. Is is the professionalism of celebrities in those five types of categories and how yes. they are presented across social media platforms? Okay, thanks, Tanisha, for the question, and thank you, Renee, uh, thank you. Diane, and then Marty, and we'll see how we're doing in terms of time after that. I hope you don't mind that I use your first name because I'll mess up your second name. Uh, Cassia, you made me think about the idea of making people more like machines and machines more like people, which seems to be the end goal these days. Uh, Also how science fiction um, ends up science. And all of this comes under the rubric of progress with a big question mark. (laughs) So thank you for introducing me to something that really is rather frightening to tell you the truth. Um, I want, my question though was for Renee. Uh, I'm familiar with um, Daniel Burstein and his work on celebrity. And I've written about Charles Lindbergh and what he did with his celebrity by becoming a political leader. Uh, I don't mind social influencers, and I don't mind them publicizing if they're a musician, the fact that they know a lot about music. I'm troubled by musicians who may suddenly become political leaders and social influencers when they have nothing uh, to uh, allow them really, nothing behind them, nothing at all. Uh, uh, And there are students even now that are becoming social influencers uh, that, to be honest with you, I wouldn't have the chutzpah, and I think you know that word since it's become (laughs) international, I wouldn't have the chutzpah to be a social influencer because uh, I don't even feel like I know enough about anything. Uh, So have you come up against that where somebody who's a musician, okay, they know a lot about music, there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. Uh, A singer, they know a lot about singing. But suddenly they become uh, political leaders and because of their celebrity are followed. 
Absolutely. Well, hi, Diane. It's lovely to meet you. Um, you definitely know something because Daniel Borstein um, has written some incredible literature and I'd love to read that if maybe we could connect um, offline about that. Um, obviously, Daniel Borstein with the Cerdo event and talks about celebrities and, and the media, um, you know, the media environment and creating a media storm, basically. That's like the short of it. Um Great question. Yes. And so, you know, I recently there was a quote in the news, I think it was Jennifer Aniston put on Instagram, you know, what is it with all these social media influencers who are becoming famous for doing nothing? So I'm not sure if you've seen that, but that's quite interesting. Um, when it comes to um, celebrity participants that I'm interviewing within those five types of um, celebrity categories that I've explained, um, there are some some celebrities who have no idea about social media um, and work for a media company, say a radio or a television, and they have social media producers and, and digital content creators who create the content for them online professionally and distribute it, therefore professionally transitioning that celebrity from whatever talent it may be into a social media influencer. So that's why it's important in my research to, while to interview this celebrity participants of all the five types of categories, to also talk to social media producers who, you know, are basically make who are who are making the social media content to make these celebrities, you know, um, relevant in the contemporary media environment. But yes, there are a lot of a lot of people online or celebrities or whoever it might be, or, you know, we've seen it with the boom in TikTok, especially during COVID in Australia. I don't know what it was like globally, um, but it basically went through the roof and, you know, the mum at home became suddenly famous just by, you know, um, making a meat pie or cooking, you know, a quiche or something like that and putting it on social media. Um, with my research, I'm specifically looking at professionals within their industry. Does that answer your question, Diane? Yes, yes. Actually, to put it in very lay terms, it seems to me that it's their way of publicizing themselves. It's a new, <laughs> it's a new road for, for publicists. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Making, you know, it, making it simple. Yeah, and I think it's very interesting, especially on my journey um, into the academic world from industry. If you ask somebody in industry, what is a celebrity? They will say Jennifer Aniston, Brad Pitt, uh, Denzel Washington, the Rolling Stones. They won't say to you, oh, a celebrity. Well, that's an attributed celebrity or, you know, a journalist, I'm an attributed celebrity. They won't think about that kind of concept. So, you know, and this is the great thing I love about the academic world because there's so many layers to it. Um, you know, into the real world. And that's what I really want um, to unite together with my research. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marty, I am a person of my word and I said you were next, but can we do it brief? Very brief. Okay. So I want to thank uh, all the presenters, Renee, Tosha, Mitra, and uh, Cassia. Uh, Cassia, also, I think the fact that you translated science and sanity in Polish is amazing. I hope you really do get a publisher. I think the institute should help you with that if they can. Uh, I guess Renee gets all the questions, though, because it's probably the most interesting topic for most people. So I'll just say this. Uh, I never heard the, the, um, the thought of achieved celebrity uh, as, a, as a description. So I'm thinking, would the opposite be unachieved celebrity, uh, which is sort of a derogatory term, I would think. But I would also think that um, anybody who has celebrity has achieved celebrity. So I'm wondering whether the, the, uh, the designation itself is a little bit misleading. But anyway, I just wanted to throw it out there as observation. So how's that for brief? Thank you. Thank you. I Thank knew you, I Mark. could count on you, Marty. <laughs> Go ahead, Renee. Um, thank you so much, um, Martin. And I just wanted to say um, everybody's research presented today was extremely interesting and I'm, I'm so thankful to be a part of this. Um, you know, cele the celebrity world, especially from my experience in the United States of America, everyone loves celebrity, whether you love or hate them. In Australia, we have a thing called the tall poppy syndrome. So even if you are a celebrity, you still have to go to America and make it uh, like Hugh Jackman or Russell Crowe before they actually call you a celebrity. Um, that's a very good point, Martin. I, you know, I mean, that would be, you know, over to Christopher Bell, the scholar who defined the five types of celebrities, I might have to drop him an email and say, listen, mate, um, do you have an unachieved celebrity? Um, you know, I guess, it, you know, it's an interesting point. And I guess the exploration for me is, you know, a lot of in my research interviews with my celebrities, a lot of them won't acknowledge that they're actually a celebrity. They find it quite uncomfortable to say, especially Australians, um, 
you know, and also Jeff from Simple Plan. I mean, he's Canadian, but he talks about traveling the world and and where his um, profile is bigger, say in Brazil, they have bodyguards, um, you know, versus someone like the Rolling Stones who have a full-time bodyguard. So yeah, it's quite, it's quite interesting. So hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> I'm just Thank mindful you. of time. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks, Marty, and thanks, Renee, again. Um, I encourage you all to keep talking, uh, either through private chat or exchange emails and continue the conversation. Uh, I just want to recommend to you, Renee, on your topic, and since you're writing your dissertation on it, there are a few people here who've written uh, some really interesting stuff about celebrity, uh, such as Lance Strait, and Susan Drucker and Gary Gumpert. Uh, so maybe you've encountered them and you just didn't mention them, but if you haven't, highly recommend it. And I'm turning this back to Lance. Thank you so much. And let's have fun for the rest of the day. Well, before we end, uh, you know, I want to actually uh, thank the participants and, and to note, um, you know, Tonisha and Anna Mitra's talks about uh, Alfred Korzybski's first book, Manhood of Humanity, um, is actually the first of several talks on that subject that we'll be having uh, over the course of uh, uh, this uh, symposium. And that has a lot to do with the fact that last year was the 100th anniversary of the publication of, of that book, which was Korzybski's first book, uh, which actually precedes his development of general semantics. Um, and I also want to note that, you know, related to both Renee and Cassia's uh, presentations, you know, and I have Korzybski's favorite quote behind me, uh, the map is not the territory. And we usually think in terms of the map as being something that is artificially constructed and the territory as being something out there. But what Renee and Cassia are both uh, interested in and concerned with is how the media itself becomes a territory that in turn requires uh, others to do some mapping. Uh, and I think that that is very much speaks to our contemporary uh, life uh, world. And, and uh, it's also uh, something that those of us who are also interested in media ecology, along with general semantics, it shows how the two really work hand in hand. Um, and, and just on that, Kasia, you know, I also wanted to note, and it's fascinating to hear you mention pattern recognition. And, and that was, of course, Gregory Bateson was famous for the quote, the pattern which connects. Uh, it was also Marshall McLuhan who said that, uh, you know, talked about pattern recognition as uh, really part of the method of making sense out of the media environment, of mapping the media environment, especially when things are coming at us so quickly. Um, and that is what's happening with those scary numbers is that they're coming by very quickly. And all you can do is try to recognize the patterns. Uh, and just real quick, do you, do you have any theory about what the numbers actually mean? I don't want to spoil because I um, uh, I supported myself with the presentation by Lexington Letter, which is book what, that is being published by Apple TV and uh, gives some clue, uh, clues uh, what um, what uh, what numbers may actually mean. But it doesn't it doesn't mean that they are totally sure. Uh, I'm, I'm totally sure after reading the book that it's that. And my personal theory is that it's about um, human engineering. This is my total personal uh, theory because there are four kinds of emotions and they, the department has four employees and they are being taught how to, and, and machine learning is being taught how they define emotions. So to me, it's a, totally about human engineering um, uh, on the level on, of, of each identity. But this is just my personal te theory. And um, employees in series ha have two theories. One is that it's preparing the humani humanity to live in the sea. Uh, and the second one is that they are cutting uh, 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 cutting dirty words from scripts of movies or from, from movies. So they have tutorials um, by themselves. So it's not like the, that abstracting process may be inhibited totally, I guess. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for that. And, and I do echo the recommendation for watching Severance. Uh, it's a great show and, and something that even folks who are not 
into science fiction actually enjoy. So thank you to all of our presenters and thank you also to Ava Berger for chairing this session. We'll take, uh, since we're running a little bit late, we'll just take about a five minute break and start up with our next session uh, in, at that time. Thank you all and feel free to chat. <laughs>